All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, as you join, I just ask that you mute yourself. Um, otherwise, we will do it too. But it's just easier if you mute yourself. Anyway, uh, my name is Michael Slotty. I am the one of the, the if not the uh, only developer advocate here at Application. Uh, and I am joined today by Application's founder and C CEO, Yuval. Um, so Yuval, I'm going to start off with the first and perhaps easiest question, uh, maybe the hardest question, actually. Would you like to share with me and the audience a little bit about yourself? Mm, obviously not, but I will do it anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Just kidding. Uh, hi, Michael. Great to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, so you are the uh, DevRel in application, at least the best one. Uh, so uh, I'm Yuval. I'm a founder and CEO of Implication, uh, 43, from Tel Aviv, Israel, father of two. Uh, being a developer for the entire uh, of my life. Uh, since I was really a kid. I've uh, been working on application for the last two and a half years. Uh, before that, I was 14 to 13 years in a company called QNOMI, VPRND and CDO. Um, uh, and that's it. Developer for the rest of my career before that. Um, pleasure to be here. Well, I mean, obviously, thank you. I don't think if you don't have to say pleasure. This is all like an application thing, but we're, I think I'm, I'm more grateful still, that you're you know, here. For, for me, talking to, to our community uh, is a real pleasure. I, I, seriously, I mean it. It's, it's not like a mini thing that just I'm just saying. Uh, and, and we'll talk about it today, and, and you will understand that community is most of uh, the, the powerful and, and most uh, uh, engaging and, and, and tool that made us happen, uh, for sure. From right. product, code, feature requests, um, marketing, everything. It, it was so helpful for, for everything. So I imagine most of our audience probably knows what application is, but we might have new members to the application Discord who might have just seen us on Twitter, not quite sure what application is, um, and we're just interested in the talk subject, which is, you know, uh, starting your startup from the first commit to where we are now. So would you like to share with uh, our audience, like at a high level, what application is? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so application is an open source platform uh, that is designed for professional developers to be able to build uh, backend uh, applications really fast without wasting time on repetitive coding tasks and, and, and boilerplate code. Uh, we generate um, best quality human readable code. The developer can uh, customize it, build on top of it, and, and make it their own in order to build uh, the best applications. Give me one second. I think our video is frozen in the stream. Uh, I'm just curious how audio is. I, I can hear you and I can see you. Can you hear me? No, no, I, sorry. I mean, I can see you in our, what we're using. I'm, I'm talking about on the Discord. I think the video is frozen. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm just going to give it a second and see what the people say. As long as they can hear us, I think that's a good thing. Okay, so we're at least able to be heard. Um, so we'll continue from there. And uh, for anyone... Um, we know we're having some technical difficulties when it comes to this, uh, but if the audio ever cuts out, just please put in chat so we know, and we'll, we'll pause so we can take up when things are up again. Um, okay, so that was a brief description as to what application is, and I want to give our audience some context for what, our, what my upcoming questions for you are going to be about. So I'm going to share a little bit of history about application. And one of the things that I think might be interesting for our audience to know is that the first commit on the application repository was on February 26th of 2020. Um, that's so that, true. That's, that's yeah. True. That, <laughs> uh, it took a lot of going through the Git history and clicking next, 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 just to get to the very end to figure this out. Uh, 
And then after I did that, I discovered there's a there's a list for the like, Git history that you can put in reverse order, <laughs> which I wish I knew that before. Anyway, uh, so that's context for our audience. Um, so before starting application, you mentioned that you were working at a company called Qnami. Um, and from what I understand, you were the CTO of Qnami. And it was about a month after you left Qnami that you started an application. So what made you jump from working at a, an established company to doing something new like application? So um, when I left Qnami, I didn't really know what I'm about to do. Um, but the problem we're solving an application was not new to me. So um, I, I was not planning on, on building application or building a startup at all. Uh, but I, I knew I, ne I needed to do uh, something else. And I decided after 13 years in Kinomi uh, to separate uh, and, and start something new. And, and obviously the... Throughout my career, I was dealing with the same issue we, issues we try to solve today. Uh, the, the speed of development, the quality of development, uh, the skill set of, of uh, employees and, and new uh, developers and new projects, uh, best pra practices, standards, quality of code. And um, when I left Kinomi, I started thinking about what I want to do. And, and I started looking on this domain to see what's what's going on in, 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 in the world in that area. And actually, when, when I was working before as, as a developer and as an engineering manager, I was always trying to, to do things like complication, but in a smaller scale, like to create my own uh, uh, templates and, and uh, add features to the platform I was developing like a product. Uh, to help developer to, to build faster and customize things on top of the product and everything. So I was starting looking at that, and that was two and a half years ago. Uh, Low-code was already a thing. It was like a buzzword, but not everybody knew about low-code. Um, and, and I started looking at it, and, and I figured out that no real solution in that domain can help uh, professional developers. So it, it's it's amazing uh, uh, set of tools that help uh, like uh, hobby developers or what they call citizen developers or even IT developers like um, technical users that know how to write function in Excel and, and want to build stuff without knowing the internals of development. Uh, but nothing was really helpful for developers. And you know, the, the thing is that uh, in my early days, I was using Access. Uh, before I was working in Qnomi, just for, for a small project and, and like things that I was working on, I was using Access and I, I, I thought that there should be something like Access, but in a much, much larger scale uh, that will allow to build really fast without dealing with all the boilerplate code and everything. And this is where I decided to go and, and, and start this uh, open source project and, and build that. Okay, so that's actually a good explanation why application. Um, and you mentioned so that there were kind of solutions, I say that loosely out there, but they were more focused on um, hobby developers. Uh, what, what did these platforms kind of lack that made you think that I needed to do this from scratch? So mainly the option to scale. So these, these local tools are very, very good to build things in smaller scale, like smaller project, or if I want to build like very cool app and I want uh, a backend just to store some data about my users, I want to build like, uh, I don't know, a game, an online game, and I just need to an API to save some uh, uh, points or, or a progress. Uh, so that's cool. But if you want to build something really in scale, like you want to build a startup, you want to build a project in an organization that's going to be called to the organization. Uh, no organization will actually use a product that comes with a vendor lock, really strict vendor lock, and, and like no option to scale, like a black box solution that you can't really... So let's, let's talk about backend as a service, for example, which are great for many use cases, but... If I want to build something, I want to build a very important uh, core business application for my organization, I can't really go to Firebase and start building my application 
and then after a while hire 15 Firebase developer to scale my application. It will not happen. So you may use Firebase for building a prototype, and once uh, you get validation from the market and everything, you need to throw away everything and start from scratch. So it may be good for authentication. It may be good for, I don't know, storing some data. But you cannot build a product in scale. So let's take, uh, I don't know, any, any big company, you know, like Stripe. They cannot build their platform on, 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 uh, on Firebase. It's just something you're not doing. You need to build something in scale. You need microservices. You need uh, big architecture. You need uh, performance. You need security. You need privacy. You need a lot of things. And uh, those those tools just does not support it. Uh, out of the box, it's that that's by design. They're not trying to support it. Uh, that's that's a different uh, audience. Mm -hmm. So professional developer and uh, a hobby or, or citizen developer just need different things. And I think like something that uh, maybe not the immediate consideration, but just because you mentioned it, it's something I used to look into because I used to care about this. Um, pricing is also more expensive with some of those backend as a service tools. Um, one example I'm going to give the audience, and again, this is just from personal experience, is like uh, uploading things to the cloud storage bucket using the Firebase SDK ends up costing more than using uh, like G Cloud's like CLI tools or just using G Cloud APIs directly. So for that convenience of uh, having a simple tool to use, you end up paying a little bit more. This was true at least that's as true. of like a year that's ago. That's true, but you know what? If I have, if I have a, a business that creates, I don't know, millions of dollars in revenue every month, and I don't really need something in scale. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing really something special that doesn't require a lot of scales and it generates a lot of money. I don't care paying the extra dollars just, just for it to work, right? But usually that's not the case. Right. If you generate millions of dollars in your, in your business, probably you have really uh, something that was built for, for scale. You build something that is ready for production, for thousands and thousands of users to be able to, to answer the business need of your business. And, and so, so, yeah, a cost is, is one parameter, but I'm not sure if that's really the parameter for, for professional developers, you know, especially yeah. when they work for organization and they have the budget and everything. So, yeah, I, I guess that's part of, part of the, the go-to market for those tools. So they start really, uh, uh, let's say, free, and then you pay uh, uh, less for, for, for starting, and then when you grow, you may, pay, you may need to pay more. But so, eventually you will live not just because of the cost. No, no, I understand that. And I'm not saying it's the biggest issue, but if you're just getting started, uh, some of these things may cost you more than you might initially expect. And it's just a point I want to raise. That's true. That's true. Um, but actually, you mentioned about like not having vendor lock-in. So that means that you're using, well, it doesn't mean, but the audience knows that probably knows that that means that we're using a tech stack that's built on open source tools that are commonly used in enterprise because the idea is, that like uh, this can be used by any company, whether it's a startup like application or some massive company like, let's say Stripe, hypothetically, since you already mentioned the name. Um, how did you guys like in the beginning settle on the tech stack that we have now? Um, because that's a long-term commitment and that's a difficult thing to change later down the road. That's that's a great question. and and. Um, I think there are two sides for that story because once, yeah, we did choose a stack and it was very critical decision to make to make sure we choose a stack that will be adopted by organization, and not only organization, developers uh, in entirety. And, and I think a lot of time I see people uh, on Discord or just send us email and so on and say, this is my exact stack, Node.js, Nest.js, Postgres, Prisma. That's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, so yeah, it, it, we went through like a very, very long uh, process of choosing technology. And, and you know, before I started working on application, I was, I was working on .NET uh, mostly, and it was a shift. So I was looking at .NET, I was looking on Java, I was looking on PHP, I was looking on uh, Go and, and other frameworks and so on. Eventually, uh, we decided to, to start with Node.js. And, and the word start is important because eventually when we talk about application as a vision, the vision is that uh, you will be able to generate your code for your app 
in any language. So yeah, right now, application is built on Node.js, but it's also generate code with Node.js. So when you, you get your code and generate it up, you get it with Node.js, Node.js, and all the stack I mentioned. As a vision, maybe it took, it's going to take another year, another two years, it depends on, on our uh, uh, process. But eventually the idea is to be able to create more generators, even the community may be able to create more generators and to get the different stacks. So I can tell you already that uh, few community members approached and say that they want to, to try to generate uh, uh, Angular apps instead of uh, React apps. So just for the client side, although our focus is on the backend, Part of the idea is to be able to generate the, the output in different stack, different languages. And, and right now we focus on OGS. On top of that, um, we will be announcing really soon uh, the plugin system, uh, which means that within the Node.js stack, uh, developers, the community, organizations will be able to create plugins that will impact the generation process in order to create their own standards or their own uh, best practices and their own, uh, um, I would say, integrations or whatever they want to add on top of applications. So right now we are very opinionated. We generate GraphQL, REST API. Uh, we generate the services with Nest.js. We, we, we generate the controllers in one way. We generate the resolvers in, in one way. Everything is very specific. And you don't, have, you don't have a lot of room. You do have already the option to select whether you want to use GraphQL or REST API, whether you want the admin UI or not. But soon you will have much greater power to decide on everything. So you can either use uh, already made plugins by application or by the community. So if you want to use MySQL instead of Postgres, if you want to use MongoDB instead of Postgres, you will be able to use that just using uh, a plugin that will change the Docker file in the generated code. It will change the connection string on the Prisma file in the generated code. And the idea is that everyone and anyone will be able to generate plugins in order to, to generate their own code. Nice. That's actually really exciting. And I, I think that's something we're hoping, correct me if I'm mistaken, to launch within the next month, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So you, heard, you heard it here first, folks. You've always committed to plugins within the next 30 days days i'm kidding um th there is a kind of timeline but uh i'm, I'm not going to force commitments here um, Cheers for that. you know it's 6 p.m in israel i can drink beer already and it is 8 a.m in the california so i'm drinking coffee um kind of wish i was in israel right now <laughs> <laughs> okay um so First commit an application February of 2020. Um, seven months later, uh, version 0. 0. 0.0.1 is released on GitHub. Um, that's not quite when the product launched, but that's like the first uh, tagged version on GitHub. So that's yeah. a seven month period. And I'm curious, during that seven month period, uh, it was just three developers working on application, yourself included in that three. So what was it like working on a fairly small team um, trying to build something from scratch? That was amazing. Seriously, just one word, amazing, because that was the, the time where we had a lot of uh, freedom to make decisions before we commit to anything. So we talked with a lot of developers and colleagues and, and, and uh, IT leaders and engineering leaders and trying to understand the problem, like the ideation process took us like a couple of months just talking to people uh, before we, we wrote the first line of code. And even before uh, we, we started creating sketches of the, of the solution, um, the, the first hire was, was a UX UI uh, designer. Uh, she was uh, with us from day one just to be able to... to vision what we want to create together with us because we knew that it should be really uh, um, a really nice product that something that was not created just by developers because you know 
developer has the notion of things that doesn't have to look good. So I just want to use the CLI. I don't care if it looks nice or not. And, and most of the time, that's not entirely true because uh, the way things look is very important for, for everyone, for users, for developers. So we do have a CLI, we do have everything. But during those months, we spend a lot of time making sure we will make the right decision. You ask about the technology stack. So I was playing with, with different stack for more than a month, just trying different things um, before deciding on Node.js. And even after deciding on Node.js, should we use Nest or maybe you should use another web framework? Should we use uh, uh, Prisma or Type ORM? Should we use Postgres or any other database? And, and so it was spending a lot of time uh, initially on, on making decision. And once the decision was made, uh, of course, we just started writing code. And we, we started um, uh, showing what we're doing for, for uh, close friends and like, you know, first circles of colleagues and things like that to get feedback uh, until we, we felt kind of ready uh, on the point you mentioned, uh, 0 0.1, when you put it live on, on, on GitHub and um, ma made the project public. So we, we started, before we made the, the, the project public, we started... Uh, with some concept and ideation and things, and, and that's where we decided to put it on GitHub and start getting feedback. So, starting a repository on GitHub is actually very, very different than forming an actual company. I can't tell you how many repos are on my GitHub where, like, this is going to be the next great idea, and nothing ever happened with it. Um, same with, like, a lot of domains I bought. Nothing ever happened with them. So... When when was it that you you came to the decision that uh, application is going to be a company? Like when was application established as a company? So I actually started very early with the understanding that I want to build something more than just a project. I want to make it a real thing because very early when we just started talking about the idea, uh, we received a lot of feedback that this is a real pain, like real engineering teams and developers and, and, and everyone we talk to. Uh, we understand there is a real pain here and uh, we decided to, to go for it and go all in and make sure we do it right. You know, building, building something like that as a side project over weekends while working on other things, that will never make it. Uh, it's, 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 it's really hard to build uh, something in that scale if you are, are not 100% committed. So once we understand we love the idea, we love the domain, we get good feedback, the, the, the validation is there, at least the initial validation is there. Uh, we decided to go uh, full blown and we actually, you know, not because uh, anything uh, like a real need, but we just wanted to hire an office in order to, to have some place to sit uh, because we started the first few weeks uh, from home and we decided it's going to be much easier to walk from an office to have like a real desk and place and, and for, for all three of us. So uh, we had to open a company just to get invoices and, and have uh, like a real account with, with the office space. Um, but we didn't really do anything with that for another year until we were ready. Um, so you mentioned that one of the things that one of the reasons why you established the company was for the office space. Um, what were some of the benefits that you think that came from the office space? Because it was a uh, co-working space in the beginning, right? Yep. So were there networking opportunities through that uh, co-working space? Well, yes. I would say that the first uh, benefit was a real place that we are committed to in order to work on that. Because when you don't have customers, you don't have users, it's just an idea. It's really easy to, to, to miss the, the commitment. So at least as a team, when it's more than just myself, and then once you have an office, it, it's somewhere to, to come and, 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 and work in from, uh, from that office every day. So that was first benefit. But other than that, yes, absolutely. We made a lot of great, you know, the, the thing is that I met Vika, our office manager, uh, and that uh, working space and we kept in touch. And when I raised the seed money, I, I offered her to, to join and she's with us. So yeah, that's one, one big uh, check that, uh, that we, I, can, I can mark a box on, on and, and where we met. But other than that, we met a lot of uh, 
uh, great people that gave us good advices that we are still in, in, in contact until this day. When you say that, um, like some of the people, you've met a lot of people, one of the people is Vika, she's with us now. Um, when you say with us now, do you mean like she's two, three yards away from you? Currently not, but this is this is our desk. You know? <laughs> okay. This is our desk, uh, but she's she's not here right now. But yeah, absolutely. I was just messaging her, asking her if she would sneak <laughs> behind you, but I guess she wasn't at her desk to see that message. Okay, that is fine. Um, you mentioned one of the first hires was a designer, and like. One of the most important things from the very beginning was to have a good design language just because developers might not care a lot about design. At least they don't think they care about design, but a good design language is, ends up what making ends up being what makes an application appealing or easy to use. Like design language kind of educates users on how to use your product. Um, has the design for applications stayed the same? through the past two and a half years? Uh, yes and no. So we do have uh, some kind of um, line that we choose from day one and we kind of walking that line or, or that path. But uh, if you look on previous version, you will see like very obvious changes. Um, and, uh, you know, we decided, uh, we, we went live uh, initially without the dark team. So it was only light. And then we decided to add a dark team. Uh, and just recently, we decided to remove the light team and just focus on the dark team because it cost us too much to spend in order to keep both. And almost no one used the light team. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's, it's evolving, it, not only because of requirements, but because of, you know, um, you, you just understand things differently um but more or less the, the the language is the same language um the first launch of application was in january of 2021 um where application was announced on hacker news i believe but prior to that you guys had ran a couple of soft launches um would you care to share like what what was the purpose of the soft launches before uh, the launch in January of 2021? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first, uh, that, that's an advice I can give to anyone who's building something. Just put it out there as early as possible. You always think it's not good enough, it's not baked enough, people will not use it, but that's not true. Uh, especially on open source, where the, the users are way more open to, to be early adopters and to get things that are not fully baked. So when we released that, uh, those soft launches before January 21, when we launched on Hacker News, uh, that was kind of control launch when we just published that on, on smaller circle, like Facebook, specific Facebook groups and, and maybe Reddit channels and stuff, just, just to, to get first uh, impression and, and feedback. And that actually helped us a lot. So I can tell you that before we launch on Hacker News uh, on January 21, you only had the option to download the code. The connection to GitHub was implemented like, I think like the weekend before the launch, just four days before we launched on, on, uh, on Hacker News, we implemented the, the sync with GitHub. And that was uh, a very uh, repetitive uh, feedback. So people were using it, but it didn't really understand the value because they could only download the code and use it once and they could not really come back to application in order to make changes because then they would have to re-download everything and how they merge it. And so the, the, the connection with GitHub, which was on our roadmap, turned out to be way more important than we, we figured out. So we went ahead and implemented that. But only, not only that, a lot of stuff, uh, bug fixes, issues that we didn't find. And once we put it there, we, we got feedback. We fix his issues, contributors that join and, and fix his issues for us. So I would say that we, we launched those soft launches because we were not ready, but we wanted to start getting feedback as early as possible. So we just put it there. Um, so after the first launch, the official launch, awesome. But I'm assuming like that's, that's almost a year after you started working on application. Um, 
how, when do you think the first contribution to application from a non-team member occurred? Because we mentioned that we started in February of 2020. So there's like hundreds, if not thousands of commits before the first open source contribution. Yeah, occurred. so, you know, when you talk about non-team, uh, it depends how you look at it. Because we had very early uh, three different, um, I would say, not direct friends, but people we knew through direction that heard about the project before we launched and they decided to kind of help us and uh, contribute code to application to gain uh, credit and experience. And that was amazing. So even before launch, but once we launched, yeah, we started to see contributions and, and ideas. And you know, when you talk about contributions, uh, maybe I'm, I'm referring to code contributions, but you know, the contribution uh, from community comes in different types of, of uh, flavors and like just opening issues is a contribution to the project because knowing about that issue helped us close the issue and prevent somebody else from, from getting that. And ideas, we get a lot of great ideas from the community. Uh, on top of code contribution, which is the, the hard core when you talk about contribution and we see them uh, throughout the, the journey. Uh, some of them, you know, just like small contributions, uh, typos or docs or uh, CSS and client and some of them are really big like we had a contribution of somebody we didn't know that approached us and say that he want to work on an open issue on GitHub that says that we need to create a CLI so a community member created our CLI from scratch the entire CLI um Okay, sorry, I thought we were frozen again for a second. I think we're no, good. I'm here, I'm here, I'm good. <laughs> um, I think our audience generally would agree with us that they love application. And if you don't love it, just pretend you do for now. Um, mm. Besides the product itself, I'd say that the community that we've developed is probably one of the best things that we, that as a company we have for us, like a loving, adoring fan base audience, whatever we want to call them. Um, what value do you think the community has had besides the contributions to code or opening issues? What other value do you think the application community has had in applications growth over the past two and a half years? I think the fact that, you know, I, I would take it just in a broader scope, not just the community, the fact that we are open source and uh, that brought us the community and then we had the option to get very early adopters uh, with the community and getting all the issues and getting users and getting people talking about it uh, on Twitter, on, on newsletters or whatever, eventually made us a company. We had the option to raise um, the, the seed round uh, before we sold anything to anyone. So we had thousands of, of users already on the platform which uh, started using the platform. Uh, and, and the way I see it, it's part of our community because they're not just using it. They're talking about it. They, they, they uh, promote it. They contribute code. They, they share issues. They go to Discord and help others to, to, to solve their issues and so on. And you know, if, if I would just go close myself with a team in a room, build, not an open source project without the community. And then I will come to the investor and say, hey, I have this great idea. Um, maybe they will agree that's a great idea, but where is the validation? Show me that somebody is using it. Show me what people are saying about it. And once we have the community behind us, that helped us uh, raise the, the, the seed round and that's what made us company. And that brought us to here. So here is, and I've said the number before, I'll say it again. Here is two and a half years after the first commit. I'm curious, how close is the current product to your original vision? Not close. Not at all. So is yeah, it... the, 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 um, uh, I would say the main characteristic is there, the main lines, the, the, the idea of where you wanna go. But when you talk about features, Every day, uh, we have new features or new ideas to do what we believe we want to do one way, another way, 
uh, we get ideas from the community, we get feedback, we have things that we added and then we decided to remove because nobody used that or, or the feedback was not uh, uh, good or we get a good feedback saying that the feature is not good uh, so and so on. So yeah, I think, um, like I said, just going into a room, close the door, building a product and then go out to the market is totally different than showing the product half-baked to the community, getting feedback, making sure the feedback loop is really, really short and quick Fix yeah. things, get more feedback, fix more things, get more feedback. And, and that's what brought us here. So um, that, that's not the same product. Maybe sure. that's the same idea. It might be the same idea. It's, it's, it's definitely not what you thought it was going to be two and a half years ago. And that's because you got the feedback from the community. Uh, you're building a product for developers. You're getting feedback from developers. Of course, the product has to change as a result. What do you think... You already mentioned plugin systems, but this is going to be my last question, and then I'm going to pass it off to the audience. What do you want to see for application? What are applications' next steps? Where do you see application, let's say, one year or five years from now? So I imagine application becoming a real uh, solution uh, or a real new way to build backend services and backend code. And, you know, just like 10 years ago, uh, a developer in a, in a company uh, would want a SQL Server, for example, uh, like just he need, he need for his own development process, he need, a, he need a database. And he would ask the IT, they called it ID at that time, it was not DevOps, uh, he would ask the IT people for a database, and we said, okay, we'll come back to you in five days, or in the, in the good case, or maybe 10, 15 days. And they would go and, and get a virtual machine at, when, when possible, or an actual computer when, when not. And then we would install the operating system, they would install patches, security, whatever. Then they would install the, the database with all the configuration and updates. And then they will need to open ports and they will need to bring the, the server or the computer and put it below the table and plug the cable and say to the, the developer, all right, here's your database, start developing. And now as a developer, if I need a database, I just need to wait 30 seconds at worst because you just need in order to spin up a new database on the cloud, that's just like that. And I imagine in five years from today, that's going to be exactly the same with everything to do with infrastructure code, like all the boilerplate code, all the repetitive coding, integration, uh, database, login, tracing, authorization, authentication, testing, whatever. You need it, you just click on something, you get the code. And the idea is that we are not trying to change the paradigm in, in, in a way that developer will not write code. We really think the developer will still write code. We don't really think that in the future, it's going to be just drag and drop or AI. I, I really think a developer will keep right code. That will not change, at least not in the next 20 years. But they will write just the important code. They will write just what makes a difference, what they want to write. And they will not spend their time on things they don't want to do or write. And you know, with, with the more the technology advance, uh, you have new technologies, new stacks, new uh, skills, even new professions. Like right now, uh, you need to know Kubernetes and Dockers and, and, and Helm charts and uh, whatever in order to spin up a database or, or to, to, start a, to start a server on, on the cloud in the cluster. Um, and, and it's become more complicated. And our idea is to make it much way simpler, where the community drive our plugin ecosystem, they build whatever they want. Uh, developer can just take the basic uh, uh, Lego bricks for their uh, infrastructure and just focus on writing uh, the important code. Awesome. Um, I think we should maybe jump to some questions. Um, so one of the questions I saw by our audience members is that uh, they were curious about what applications work like office model? Is it a hybrid uh, office model? Is application office first, work from home? Um, I guess if you want to share a little bit of that information for our audience members. 
Yeah, sure. So we do have an office in Tel Aviv, uh, quite a big office. If anyone wants to come and work in the office, they can, but nobody is required to come to the office. We already have 15 employees in application, 16 next week. Uh, and uh, they are um, half of it in Israel. The other half is not in Israel. So we have two in the US. We have India. We have uh, Amsterdam. We have Poland. We have UK next week. Uh, and, and, and just growing. Uh, and as an open source company, the idea is to be able to hire um, the uh, employees and to get contributors and community that want you to help and work on the project from all over the places, all over the world. Uh, and all the, the, the vision is to be, uh, I would say, remote first. So you can work from anywhere. Uh, if you want to come to, to an office, it can be our office right now in Tel Aviv or any other office if required in the future. Uh, you can come in the office, but if you don't need to, you can save the, the commute time. You can save any uh, uh, hassles of uh, going to an office and just walk from anywhere. You can walk from a coffee. You can walk from a shared office space next to your home. Uh, we are open to it. Nice. Um, let's see. I, I'm the... glad you discovered that now. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. What was that? Oh, I said, yeah, I'm glad you discovered that right now. You're working from uh, West Coast and we are in Tel Aviv. Um, you know, you, you are required to move to Israel and work from here, right? That's what we agreed uh, initially. Uh, I would love to. <laughs> but... And I'm just going to pretend the video is frozen. Okay. Um, <laughs> does, okay, so we... I would love to see if anyone else has any more questions, but uh, while giving the audience a chance to answer some more questions, ask some more questions, um, I'll just start asking some random questions. Um, what? I, I can you... ask you questions. Sh sure, why not? Let's go over that. All right. Um, so, you know, I would love to hear your uh, public take on how is it to work with application. So you are remote, you are in the US, uh, it's open source. Uh, when you write code or when you do something, it's all public. Uh, you need to be available for the community. You need to work with the community. How is it? It's the most awful experience I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm kidding. No, um, I, I actually really enjoy it compared to other experiences that I've had. Um, this is probably giving me the opportunity to work and talk to developers the most. Um, a lot of that, I think, comes from like the active Discord community, active uh, people being active on GitHub, um, people being active on Twitter and stuff like that. And especially in this environment um, where we're kind of post-COVID, but not everything is the same, um, there's a lot of opportunities to interact with other developers, which is really, really exciting for me. Because I, I've said this before, I say it again, that one of the highlights um, and one of the reasons why I got into developer relations is I want to empower developers to be able to create amazing software applications, the next world changing experience. Um, as a result of this, I think application is one of those tools that empowers developers to do that. So for me, I, one, I'm really happy to work with an, a company that's empowering developers. Two, I'm really happy to be working uh, in a community where developers are passionate about the product and are building a community, um, not just about application, but just a general developer community. Um, one of the highlights, uh, we have a Slack channel called Programming Memes. Sorry, not Slack, Discord channel called Programming Memes. Uh, it is one of my pride and joys in this community, um, but also just general uh, seeing people uh, share their experiences, uh, how they came into software development, asking questions like what I should do next. So for me, I think those are the highlights of my experience. The only downside to working with a remote team like application is... Um, when it's like 8 a.m. for me, it's 8.30 p.m. for Sarav. When it's 8 a.m. for me, it's 6 p.m. for you, I think. So sleep, that's the only thing I'm missing. But other than that, 
It's been great. Okay, I think I think uh, you're hired. Yeah. I like <laughs> um, I think I think that'll be it because I don't think we have that any more questions. Right. Um, this video will end up on YouTube. Oh, we have. Okay, we have one question sliding in. I hope you don't mind taking the question real yeah, quick. Absolutely. Go ahead. So uh, one of our audience members asks, what are the challenges of being an open source company? Seriously. Um, you, you may look it as a challenge, but it's not a challenge. It's more of a benefit. It's the fact that everybody can see what you're doing. Um, so it just make you write better code, make you open better issues, make you uh, communicate uh, clearly and, and, and a very, because you always know that people read it and, and that's great. That's, that's not a challenge. Maybe it was a challenge initially when, when you write code and you say, wow, people look at my code and uh, especially for, for uh, new contributors and open source and new employees that join application and never wrote open source uh, before. But I, I don't really see any disadvantage of, of using open source, seriously. Uh, I'm saying it after two and a half years working on open source. Just This is just amazing. Awesome. OK, um, I am going to thank our audience for joining us today. Uh, we are hoping to upload this video to YouTube in the future. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you're interested in joining one of these live streams in the future, uh, go to application.com uh, and you'll see a link to join our Discord. And so we try to run these office hours maybe once every other month or so. Uh, so you'll be able to join us live, ask your questions then. Otherwise, you can enjoy this on YouTube later. Um, anyway, to our audience and community, thank you for joining us today. You've all, thank you for taking time off. Um, because I know this is like after hours for you. So thank you for joining no, that's me just and the community. Of the day. Okay. All good. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure. I always happy uh, talk and, and um, give back to the community. I hope this uh, session helped uh, members of our community. And um, it's all fun. All right. Well, that is it for us, everyone. Have a great rest of your Sunday. And we hope to see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.